All right, now let's take a look at the last section in 19 to 21, and in this next hour, I'd just like to bang out this last section and talk about what happens in probably one of the most sad stories that ends sadly, it really does. But then we'll pick it up and help you feel better about life, because then we're gonna move into 1 Samuel, okay? In chapter 19, the final section of Judges continues the theme that there was no king in Israel, and everybody did that which was right in their own eyes. And that section records some heinous acts of the tribe of Benjamin and the ensuing war that happens with the rest of the nation. And, and the book ends with Israel mourning at the loss of one of their tribes or near loss of one of their tribes uh, and, and, and really not celebrating the land that they've been brought into. The whole idea was they, God gave them this land and all they did was just blow it up and, and crush a tribe and have all kinds of poor standards. All right. When you get into verses one and two, here's the setting, and the setting starts off as compromised leadership. If I had two words for it, it'd be compromised leadership in verses one and two. <coughs> it came about in those days when there was no king in Israel that there was a certain Levite staying in the remote part of the hill country of Ephraim who took a concubine for himself from Bethlehem in Judah. It's interesting because now we're again with a Levite. We now have again a Judah, um, a Judah born or Judah raised Levite, and another story. So the first story was really about that. The second story begins the same way. Um, just like the story of Micah, who, was a, who, who saw a Levite, who was supposed to be a representative of God, here's another one. But look at what he does. His concubine played the harlot against him. She went away from him to her father's house in Bethlehem in Judah and was there for a period of four months. If we're going to walk with God the way we're supposed to, we need to choose leaders whose lives are without compromise. Here's a Levite who's obviously compromised and his family situation is compromised. If my wife runs off, I shouldn't be pastor next week. Can I say that very clearly? If my wife runs off, I shouldn't be pastor next week. Why? Because there's a standard in 1 Timothy that says I need to have control in my house. Now, let me be very clear about that standard. That standard has everything to do with the marriage I have to my wife. What if my 28-year-old child goes out and shoots somebody? Am I out of ministry? No, because I can't do anything about it. If they're 16... I can certainly do all kinds of legal things and counseling things to help them. The issue is, does the person in ministry do everything that they can do legally, morally, ethically to fix the problem? Because they're not unqualified because they have problems. Everybody has problems. They're unqualified when they don't deal with them. So here's a guy who's off in, in a, let's just say, a compromised position as leader. And then what I see is sidetracked leadership. In verses 3 through 9, sidetracked leadership. The father of this Levite's concubine managed to sidetrack the Levite from getting back home for five days. He kept preparing to go, but time and time again, he would eat, eat, end up eating and drinking the day away. And, and here's the thing. Listen to the story. Her husband rose, went after her to, to, to speak tenderly to her. I want you to see those words for a minute. He's going to go and he's going to lovingly entreat her. Does he sound like a good guy? At least in verse 3, he sounds like a, a tender-hearted guy. He's going to try to win her back. And it says, taking with him his servant and a pair of donkeys. So she brought him into her father's house, and when the girl's father saw him, he was glad to meet him. His father-in-law, the girl's father, detained him, and he remained with him three days. So he ate and drank and lodged there. Now on the fourth day, they got up early in the morning. He prepared to go, and the, and the girl's father said to the son-in-law, Sustain yourself with a piece of bread, and afterwards you may go. So both of them sat down and ate and drank together, and the girl's father said to the man, Please be willing to spend the night. And, l and let your heart be merry. Let's have a party tonight. Stay. Why are you leaving? Stay here. Then the man rose to go, but his father-in-law urged him so, so that he spent the night there again. And on the fifth night, he rose to go early in the morning. And the father said, uh, please sustain yourself and wait until the afternoon. So both of them ate. And when the man arose to go with the, his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the girl's father, said to him, behold, now the day has drawn to a close. Please spend the night. Lo, the day is coming to an end. Spend the night here that your heart may be merry. Then tomorrow you may arise early for your journey so that you may go home. Do you see what he's doing? 
Now, in the beginning of this, it says that she had, um, I think the, she had gone and played the harlot against him. Now, that lets you think that she's out on the road selling her body or something like that. That's not what's going on here. It was wrong for her to go back to her father's house and deny the marriage in favor of her father. It doesn't mean there's any sex in this. The story just means she's supposed to be living with him and she leaves him and she's no longer walking as his wife. She goes back to her old hometown and her old setting. Am I telling you she didn't do wrong? She did wrong. Am I telling you that it's at the level of harlotry? That word is used to show that the marriage is broken. In other words, the vow of her remaining with her husband. It doesn't necessarily mean sex, although it could. My, and my point in the whole thing is somehow we color the whole thing by a simple word harlot and what we see is this prostitute and what we do is we dump in sex. It was enough that she left her husband, went lived with her dad and didn't come back to her husband. That was already wrong. And it seems to me that the father is not only complicit, that he's behind this. Do you see it? And here's the thing. Leaders need to be diligent and capable and avoid getting pulled off task. And this is a Levite, so he's a leader. And instead of being able to lead, he's, he couldn't lead her. And now he's not leading the father-in-law and he's getting pulled off task. The question I have is, what's he supposed to be doing? Well, he's spending day after day after day having another party every night. What's he supposed to be doing? Some crops are not getting tended. Some Levitical responsibilities are not getting undertaken. So when you get to verse 10 to 21, you start to see an out-of-touch leadership. And those are the words I'd put in, out-of-touch leadership. The Levite refused to go back to, into the city of foreigners, but he was willing to go into the tribe of Benjamin. He may have thought that staying with the city of, a city of his brothers would have made him safe, but it was clear that the man who offered him a place to stay uh, knew that staying outside in the city square was not safe. Leaders need to be aware of the state of their people, and we can fool ourselves into thinking that the world is, is, is the only one with problems, and our people don't have those problems, but that's not true. I want you to see in verse 10, it says, the, the, the man was not willing to spend the night, so he arose and departed and came to a place opposite Jebus, that is Jerusalem today, and there were with him a pair of saddled donkeys, his concubine was also with him. When they were near Jebus, the day was almost gone, and the servant said to his master, Please come and let us turn aside into the city of the Jebusites and spend the night in it. However, his master said to him, We will not turn aside into a city of foreigners who are not as the sons of Israel. We will go on as far as Gibeah. You see what he does? He says, I'm not going in that Gentile place. I'll go into this other place. It's also Jewish. It's going to be like us. It's not like them. It's probably as depraved as anywhere else. In other words, you can, you can say, listen, I, I need counsel. I'm just going to go to a church and assume because you went to a church, you're going to get the Bible. That's not true. There's plenty of them that are just making it up. <laughs> okay. So the, the point is that he thinks he's safe because he makes a choice based on who the people are or who he thinks they should be. It says, um, verse 13, he said to his servants, come and let us approach one of the places and we will spend the night in Gibeah or Ramah. So they passed along, went their way. The sun set on them near Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. They turned aside there in order to enter and lodge in Gibeah. When they entered, they sat down in the open square of the city for no one took them into the house to spend the night. You have to understand that a lack of hospitality in and of itself is a condemnation on a city. They're, they're not supposed to do that. If you see somebody in the city square, you're supposed to invite them in for the night. This was one of the critical things that came out of Deuteronomic law. You were strangers yourselves. Don't let anyone be a stranger in your land. Invite them in. Hospitality was one of the ways that you marked godliness. So when they didn't see anybody offering them a place... I'm sure that they started to get nervous. Then behold, an old man was coming out of the field from his work at evening. Now the man was from the hill country of Ephraim. He was staying in Gibeah, but the men of that place were Benjamites. He lifted up his eyes and saw the traveler in the open square of the city. And the old man said, where are you going and where did you come from? He said to them, we are passing from Bethlehem and Judah to, uh, to the remotest part of the hill country of Ephraim, for I am from there and I went to Bethlehem and Judah, but I am now going to my house and no man will take me into his house. 
that the end of that, no man will take me into his house, leads you to believe that he's had conversations with some, but nobody's offering him a place. That, by the way, marks that city. Then verse 19, yet there is both straw and fodder for our donkeys, and also bread and wine for me, your maidservant, and the young man who is with your servants. There's no lack of anything. So the older man says, come. Uh, you know, and it says, the old man said, peace be you. Only let me take, take care of all your needs. However, do not spend the night in the open square. It, 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 it's obvious to me that the man knows that this is a dangerous place. It's obvious to me that there's an issue involved in this. And it says, um, so, so he took him in the house and gave the donkeys fodder, and they washed their feet and ate and drank. While they were celebrating, behold, the men of the city, certain worthless fellows. Do you see that phrase again? Where did you see that before? Worthless fellows. Yeah, the Abimelech story. So the son of Gideon and the hiring worthless fellows, okay? Certain worthless fellows surrounded the house, pounding the door, and they spoke to the owner of the house, the old man saying, bring out the man who came into your house that we may have relations with him. <laughs> I mean, there's a good opening line, you know? I mean, really, and, and then the man, the owner of the house went out to them and said to them, no, my fellows, please do not act so wickedly since this man has come into my house. Do not commit this act of folly. The, the interesting problem here is that look at the level of sexual depravity here. This shows a deep sexual perversion in the hearts of the men in the city. Look, when believers continue to slip from the standard of the Lord, one clear, one clear sign will be tolerance of sexual sin. One of the clear ways you will mark a line between believers who are walking with God and believers who are not will be Tolerance of sexual sin. And the issue here is, here's a guy who's got these people in his house. He's trying to stand there. And, and what I think is interesting is the Levite shows up with no sense that this is what's going to happen, that they are really imperiled by where they are. What I'm interested in is, is when you get down to verse 23, you start to see that um, he's starting to plead with them, but but. Look at the way he's willing to sacrifice a helpless person. Here is my virgin daughter, verse 24, and his concubine. Let me bring them out that you may ravish them and do with them whatever you wish. How many of you think this sounds like a good idea? From the standpoint of the girls, they're back there going, what? <laughs> and from the standpoint of the guys in the room, you got to be standing here going, what is wrong with you? but do not commit such an act of folly against this man. It appears to me that he knows that they're not interested in those girls. It appears to me that they, he knows what these men are all about. And as a result, it says, but the men would not listen to him. So the man seized his concubine and brought him out to her and they raped her and abused her all night until morning. Then they let her go at the approach of dawn. What I think is interesting is look at the amount of time that this woman was held back by the father-in-law in the beginning of the story. And now look at her end. Her end is, is terrible. Now, I think one of the things that happens is that there's a lack of willingness to punish sin. And what you end up here with here is, is um, the men would not listen to him. They seized his concubine. Look at verse 26. As the day began to dawn, the woman came and fell down at the doorway of the man's house where the master was until full daylight when her master rose in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out then behold his concubine was lying at the doorway at the house uh, with her hands on the threshold he said to her get up and let us go but there was no answer then he placed her on a donkey and the man arose and went to his home and he entered his house he took a knife and laid hold of the concubine and cut her in 12 pieces limb by limb and sent her throughout the territory of israel all who saw it said nothing like this has ever happened or been, since the, been seen when the sons of Israel came up from the land of Egypt to this day. Consider it, take counsel, and speak up. Here's what I want you to see. Instead of a brokenness over what had happened, things just get worse. He ends up chopping up the body of his concubine and sending her out. And, and here's the thing. People are horrified and shocked at this level of sinfulness. Can I tell you something? What those men did to her before she was ever chopped up was every bit as bad as chopping her up. Nope. 
Here's the thing. An open rape in a square repeatedly, a gang rape in a square, and nobody thought that was something you needed to take care of right then? What I'm impressed by is the fact that this guy slept through the night and got up in the morning. Can you, can, can you imagine that? Can you imagine how cold relationships between people had become to get to here? What has to happen in your life for you to be so cold toward people that you are in the place of going, wow, this is, this is okay? I want you to understand something. When you start away from God's program, things will get darker and darker, and you cannot believe the level to which you will sink. You will lie, cheat, steal routinely. And you're going to watch in our society as we walk away from the standard of God. People are going to do things that are absolutely shattering. What's the end point of it? He sends out all of these body parts. He shocks them by sending out these body parts. In verse 1 it says in chapter 20, Then all the sons of Israel from Dan to Beersheba, including the land of Gilead, came out, including the ones who were on the other side of the Jordan. Everybody heard about body parts. And the congregation assembled as one man to the Lord at Mitzpah, which is east, uh, east of Jerusalem over in the wilderness. And the chiefs of all the people, even all the tribes of Israel, took their stand in the assembly and the people of God, 400,000 foot soldiers who drew the sword. Now the sons of Benjamin heard that the sons of Israel had gone up to Mitzpah, and the sons of Israel said, tell us, how did this wickedness take place? <coughs> I want you to underline at the end of verse 3, how did this wickedness take place? And I'd like to hear your answer as to how it took place. How did it get this bad that this could happen? They aren't following the Lord anymore. They aren't following the Lord and they've turned off one standard after another to which wrong became right and normal. Your eyes adjust to the darkness in the room and now darkness has fallen on the land and it looks normal to them. This is the right question. How did we get here? But here's the problem. When we are facing a cataclysm in morality in this country, nobody's asking, how did we get here? We're not even at the place where it's bad enough yet. How did we get here? And, and the issue is we got here because we ignored what our founding fathers gave us as a biblical morality. We forgot who we were. That's how we got here. And now we're fighting because of color and race. Now we're running around killing off our next generation and now we're, we're destroying marriage and we're walking on as if there's progress. <coughs> and the fact of the matter is the next graduating class from every high school will be more screwed up than the one before it. There's no question in my mind because you can't get the right answer by asking the wrong question. And the bottom line here is they start going, how did this happen? Now what I'm interested in is the men of, uh, of Gibeah, uh, verse 4, Levite, the husband of the woman who was murdered, answered and said, I came with my concubine to spend the night at Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. By the way, he didn't cut her up while she was alive. But the, 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 the whole point is that she didn't answer him, so he assumed that she had died. She put it, he put her, her up on the donkey and brought her back, and she was dead by the time they got there. He had no medical understanding of what to do. Frankly, if you got hurt out in the field, you, you, they'd just as likely sever an arm or a leg as set a leg, because if you had a compound fracture, they weren't always sure they knew what to do with it. You have to remember that the, this was a time when they had very, very limited knowledge of what they were doing. So he took her corpse and, and, and sent out pieces of it. But look what it says. It says, they intended to kill me. Instead, they ravished my concubine so that she died. I took hold of my concubine, cut her in pieces, and sent her throughout the land of Israel's inheritance. For they have committed a lewd and disgraceful act in Israel. Behold, all you, the sons of Israel, give your advice and counsel here. By the way, he could have simply, without giving the concubine, come and drawn a whole group of people together and said, these guys banged on the door so that they could rape us. These men wanted to rape the men that were in this house. You know why? He, he wouldn't have gotten people together. He needed the piece of the concubine in order to get them to the meeting. Because if they're not shocked by how bad it's become, people just slowly let it change. 
So he says in verse 7, Behold, all of you sons of Israel, give your advice and counsel. Then all the people rose as one man, saying, Not one of us will go to his tent, nor any of us return to his house. But now this thing which we'll, we will go, do to Gibeah, we will go up against it by lot. And we will take ten out of a hundred throughout the tribes of Israel, and a hundred out of a thousand, and a thousand out of ten thousand to supply food for the people. And when they come to Gibeah of, of Benjamin, they will punish them for all their disgraceful acts which they have committed in Israel. Thus all the men of Israel were gathered against the city, united as one man. Then the tribes of Israel sent men through the entire tribe of Benjamin, saying, What is this wickedness that has taken, us, have taken place among you? Now then, deliver up the men, the worthless fellows in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and remove this wickedness from Israel. But the sons of Benjamin would not listen to the voice of their brothers, the sons of Israel. They're actually going to come to, to the defense of these guys. They are unwilling to punish them. Well, here's what you're going to see. As lines are drawn in our country, people will clearly do wrong and people will just surround them and not let anybody punish them for what they're doing. And the fact of the matter is, there's wrong on all sides here. But the reality is, these guys, this was a heinous wickedness. I'm not saying the other tribes were all pristine. I'm saying they did the right thing by surrounding them and saying, you take care of it and we won't have to, but if you don't, we will. And then it says, then the tribes of Israel sent men through the entire tribe of Benjamin saying, what is this wickedness that's taken place? Remo now then deliver up the men, the worthless fellows in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and remove this wickedness. But the sons of Benjamin would not listen. Verse 14, the sons of Benjamin gathered from the cities of Gibeah to go out to battle against the sons of Israel. From the cities of, on that day, the sons of Benjamin were numbered 26,000 men who drew the sword beside the inhabitants of Gibeah who were numbered 700 choice men. Out of these people, 700 choice men were left-handed. Each one would <coughs> sling a stone at a hair and not miss. In other words, they had reason to believe they had a secret weapon that was going to make them able to win. That's the point. Their secret weapon was these incredibly <laughs> accurate slingers. <coughs> then the men of Israel beside Benjamin were outnumbered. 400,000 men who draw the sword. All these were men of war. Now the sons of Israel rose, went up to Bethel, inquired of, the, of God, and said, Who shall go first for us against the sons of Benjamin? Look at that. You can say that the other tribes weren't walking with God, but you can say that there's only one group of the two in the battle that's inquired of the Lord about anything. So they stop and say, this is wrong, Lord. We're not going to let it stand. We're going to go and fight them. Who should lead us? Why? Because they don't have any leaders. <coughs> the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. So he sends the tribe of Judah and the sons of Israel arose in the morning and camped against Gibeah. The men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin. The men of Israel arrayed for battle against them at Gibeah. The sons of Benjamin came out of Gibeah and fell to the ground on that day, 22,000 men. But the people, the men of Israel, encouraged themselves and arrayed for battle again in the, in the place where they had arrayed themselves the first day. The sons of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until evening and inquired of the Lord, shall we again draw near for battle against the sons of my brother Benjamin? And the Lord said, go up against him. You see that they went up and they had an incredible amount, uh, an incredible fight. And Israel lost some men and Benjamin lost some men. And then they go back to the Lord and say, should we do this again? Should we, should we fight him again? Why do you think they're inquiring, should they fight again? <coughs> they lost 22,000 men to the secret <coughs> weapon of Benjamin. And so they're coming back and going, Lord, we were trying to do the right thing. What does that tell you? The cost of your sin will even go into innocent lives before it's done. Innocent people paid the price with their life before it was done. Now, here's what's interesting. It goes on and says, um, they wept before the Lord. They inquired of him. The Lord said, go up against him. The sons of Israel came against the sons of Benjamin the second day. Benjamin went out against them from Gibeah second day and fell to the ground. Again, 18,000 men of the sons of Israel. All these drew the sword. In other words, they're not killing people who are not in the battle, but they're killing a mass number of people of Israel. Look what God is doing. God sent Israel into Benjamin to correct the behavior of Benjamin. So why is God letting Israel take such losses? Why? 
Now, sin affects the nation, but they had let it get this bad. They are part of the problem. You, you are not going to fix this problem without taking losses on your own. And, and when you let things go, you pay a price even on your side of it. It's not just bad people that pay a price. Good people paid a price. A lot of them, 22,000, then another 18,000. That's 40,000 people cut down because they let it happen. So that all the sons of Israel and all the people went up and came, verse 26, came to Bethel and they wept and they remained there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening and they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. The sons of Israel inquired of the Lord for the Ark of the Covenant was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, Aaron's son, stood before it to minister in those days, saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the sons of my brother Benjamin or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into your hand. Now that's a new prophecy. Go up again, third time, you're going to win. Israel went up in ambush around Gibeah. Sons of Israel went up again against the um, uh, sons of Benjamin. On the third day, they arrayed themselves against Gibeah as at other times. The sons of Benjamin went out against the people and were drawn away from the city. And they began to strike and kill some of the people as at other times on the highways, one of which goes to Bethel and the other to Gibeah. And in the field, about 30 men of Israel. The sons of Benjamin said, they are struck down before us as at the first. But the sons of Israel said, let us flee that they will draw them away from the city to the highways. Then all the men of Israel arose from their place and arrayed themselves at, at Baal Tamar. And the men of Israel in ambush broke out of their place, even at Ma'are Geba. And 10,000 choice men from all Israel came against Geba. The battle became fierce, but Benjamin did not know that disaster was close to them. And the Lord struck Benjamin before Israel so that the sons of Israel destroyed 25,100 men of, the, of Benjamin that day, all who draw the sword. So the sons of Benjamin saw that they were defeated. And when the son of Israel gave ground to the Benjamin because they, they relied on the men in ambush, uh, whom they had sent uh, against Gibeah. The men in ambush hurried and rushed against Gibeah. The men in ambush also deployed and struck all the city with the edge of the sword. Now, the appointed sign between the men of Israel and the men in the ambush was that they would make a great cloud of smoke arise from the city. Then the men of Israel turned in the battle and Benjamin began to strike and kill about 30 men of Israel. For they said, surely they are defeated before us as in the first battle. But when the cloud began to rise from the city in a sm column of smoke, Benjamin looked be behind him and behold, the whole city was gone up in smoke to heaven. Then the men turned. The men of Benjamin were terrified. They saw that disaster was close to them. Therefore, they turned their backs before Israel toward the direction of the wilderness. But the battle overtook them while those who came out of the cities destroyed them in the midst of them. They surrounded Benjamin, pursued them without rest, and trod them down opposite Gibeah toward the east. 18,000 men of Benjamin fell. All these were valiant warriors. The rest turned and fled toward the wilderness to the rock of Ramon, and they caught 5,000 of them on the highways and overtook them at Gibeon and killed 2,000 of them, so that all Benjamin who fell that day were 25,000 men who draw the sword. All of these were valiant warriors, but 600 men Men turned and fled toward the wilderness to go to the rock of Ramon, and they remained at the rock of Ramon four months. The men of Israel turned back against the sons of Benjamin, struck them by the edge of the sword, both the entire city with the cattle and all that were found. They also set on fire all the cities which they found. So you end up with this disunity and this terrible conflict, and you end up with the whole thing coming apart because the people of God were focused on letting everybody do what they wanted. See, when everybody tolerates everybody else's sin, eventually it blows up in your face. Sin brings about death. Sin brings about consequences. They let it go, and now it blew up on them, and they weren't sure what to do about it. And, and by the time you get to chapter 21, look at what they're doing. They're, they're mourning and they're broken. And now they make detrimental vows. The men of Israel consulted the Lord before going against their brothers, but they went, go, we, they went beyond going to war. They made a vow not to allow any of their daughters to marry the tribe of Benjamin. They, they went beyond what God told them. Because one of the things that happens is when so much pain is allowed, the backlash of that pain goes well beyond righteousness. It goes into, into vengeance. And so for the first seven verses, they're like, we're not even going to let our, our, our women marry them. Well, what's going to happen to them? 
What's going to happen if the tribe is drawn all the way down to the bottom and there's no one to marry into that tribe? They've destroyed their cities. They've ruined their families. They've uprooted the people. They've killed off many of the men without reseeding that tribe again. That tribe would die off from the earth. Because they made promises, they were forced to come up with other solutions. So God's people have to consult God before making vows. The first seven verses are about them making a vow God never told them to make. You can become more righteous than God. In your own eyes and in your own conceit, you can go, I am going to do more than God said. Well, you do more than God said and you did what God didn't tell you to do. That's what it comes down to. In verses 8 to 15, they force a solution. What's the solution? The sons of Israel take and kill all the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead for not coming to Mitzvah. Now there's retribution on tribes in the east who didn't come. And they take 400 virgins from the tribe and they give them to the sons of Benjamin. So now they're killing off somebody over here who wasn't at the battle, taking those girls and depositing them into Benjamin and making them be part of Benjamin. Here's the problem. They're treating the girls like cattle. <coughs> what they're doing is answering sin with sin. That's what revenge is. Revenge is when you answer sin with sin. When you take on to yourself something. When we jump into something that creates other problems, we, we, we can feel the need to force a solution on the problem, but we have to be careful not to compound sin with sin, and that's what they're doing here. Let's get down to the end of the chapter, because we've got to close this off to go to a break. In... Um, in the end of it, in 16 to 25, you have a story of planning wrong as a solution. What happens when, you, when you're in vengeance mode is you start to add sin to sin, and now they're planning wrong. There wasn't enough women. The elders of Israel proposed that the sons of Benjamin lay in wait during a feast and kidnap the daughters of Shiloh. Uh, can you believe this? What if Congress came to the, uh, you know, to the conclusion that Louisiana is lacking people, so what we're going to do is we're going to have them poise themselves outside of New Orleans. And all the tourists that come out, they just take all the girls out of the cars and kidnap them. That's the solution they came up with. Is that the dumbest thing you've ever heard? And the reality is the elders said that they would not hear the fathers and brothers of these men if they came to complain. They, they actually got all the leaders on board with, with a kidnapping. What, by the way, do you remember the law? Are you allowed to kidnap? No. One of the fundamental laws of life that God gave was that the freedom of the person was intrinsically valuable to God. So they're, they're breaking the law in order to fix a problem because people broke the law. This is, you know what we need to do? We need to get a bunch of police officers to brutalize people because those people are doing wrong. How dumb is that? When you walk in and you brutalize people, even if they were wrong, is that the right way to get the result? If you don't have law and order, if you don't put it underneath a system and everybody can trust the system, the system will break. So here's the bottom line. You can't plan to do wrong to an, and encourage other people to do wrong to get right. If I had anything to write next to verses 16 to 25, it would be this. Never do wrong to get the right result. Never do wrong to get the right result. Always do right. Don't do wrong. The ends do not justify the means ever. If it's wrong, it's wrong. Do not do wrong to get the right result. You won't. By the end, by the way, you get to the end of the book and look at verse 25 and put a box around it. In there, those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. The purpose of the book of Judges, and you should mark it right there after verse 25, the purpose of this book was for Samuel to record what had happened in the period of the Judges for Saul and the kings that followed him so that they would understand that there was systems and order that needed to be put in place with the kings. And that's why this next segment we're going to bring about is Samuel and the last judge and how that comes about and why it's so important. If there isn't someone running a system, the system will break. And so the end statement here is probably given by Samuel.